So our last speaker for the day uh, is an SU alumnus. I'm very proud of that. Uh, he has written a book that I love and I tweet and speak about all the time. And his book is called Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay. Please welcome Federico Pastino. Federico. So thank you for uh, inviting me and for all coming here, having this great conversation. I hope to contribute to something that you'll find useful. There we go. OK. So uh, this is the book I wrote, but I don't think I need to talk about this because it was well covered by uh, most speakers before me. And also, if anything, I'm here to just make a joke about it. <laughs> so um, I would like to talk about the implications of it. So let's assume that there's going to be disruption, whether it is because of technological unemployment or because of other reasons. But I think we can all agree there's going to be massive disruption within the next few years, probably just three or four. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, implications. And I want to focus on one particular aspect, which is unconditional basic income. So um, well, before I talk about it, actually, I just want to mention a couple of things that uh, came up in my head as uh, you guys were talking. I think two slides are missing from Peter's uh, presentation. One is that the income inequality uh, gap um, advances exponentially, uh, especially in the US, but also in other countries. Uh, most um, uh, worrying some in the most developed countries where you would expect uh, this, th this effect not to be so prevalent. And the other is the ecological debt. Uh, we've been um, in ecological debt since the 1970s, and we'll be We've been going worse and worse and worse every year, and it doesn't see any, there doesn't seem to be any slowing down on this. So we need to address these kind of things, but now I'm just going to talk about this one because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so there is a lot of ideas. People have ideas and assumptions about what a basic income means, and they have um, sort of, there is a conventional wisdom brought by various ideologies or political thinking or just our common sense of what the effects of a condition of a basic income would be in society. And there is a lot of a misunderstanding of what an unconditional basic income is because there are lots of variations. One is called basic income guarantee, and the other one is the um, passive income tax. So there are lots of different things, but the specific one that I'm, that I'm going to talk about today is unconditional basic income. So um, one can talk about the moral and the social implications. I think that that would be the most interesting part for the Q&A discussion. And I could make the moral argument for an unconditional basic income, but I'm not going to do that now. I just want to look at the data first. And instead of having an idea or an ideology and, try and then try to cherry pick the data to fit whatever ideology I have, I'm going to do exactly the opposite. I'm going to look at the data and then based on the results from real people who are actually in the real world <laughs> being examined using um, scientific studies, then we're going to try to make sense of the data. Because actually in my book, I was against the idea of an unconditional basic income because studies have shown that even people with full unemployment benefits, so they, they supposedly had no reason to be unhappy, they were the most unhappy uh, people of the entire sector of society. Okay? Even unhappier than those who were unemployed and were not receiving the benefits. Um, so there is a caveat to this, I'm going to address it later. So let's just look at the data. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular study, and uh, this is not the only study. There are many studies. There was another one done in uh, Kenya. Uh, there are studies done in uh, the Bulsia Familia in uh, uh, Brazil, but they're not exactly unconditional basic income, and some of them had, m had methodological errors that uh, I think they kind of skew the results. So this particular study was very well done. It was the randomized control trial. Uh, it was uh, it was published recently, last year, so 18 months between 2011 and 2013. They had 12,000 people involved, and there were 20 villages. Eight of them received the unconditional cash, tr cash transfer or basic income, and 12 of them were the control group. Um, even though the numbers are different, it was about 6,000 people each, uh, and they worked at the level of the village. That is hugely important because other studies have been performed at the level of the family of the individual and then I think completely nullifies the results because you have a different kind of social behavior when you have an entire community acting in the same way. Uh, so I'm not saying that those other studies are useless, I'm just saying I don't know what they're accounting for. Um, it was the first time done in Indian history and one of the first times it was actually done well at a global scale. Uh, so how much are we talking about? It was 300 rupees per adult and 150 rupees per child. Yes, even children received the income and it was given to them directly. Uh, I think it was a threshold. If you were below seven, your mom was, was managing your 
uh, your income, but if you were between 7 and 18, you managed your income. So even children had their own money, right? Um, the average family uh, was receiving about $24 per month, and we might laugh at this, but this was actually calculated to be exactly enough to cover the basic needs for those people in those villages. Uh, so these, uh, the, the, these are the conditions. Uh, um, so let's talk about what unconditional basic income means. It means unconditional, so there are no conditions whatsoever. So one of the many things that we, um, the common wisdom says, well, we should have a conditional cash transfer. I'll give you money if such and such. For example, if you are below the, the poverty threshold, I'll give you the money. Or if you put your kids to school, or if you buy food, or if you such and such. And this kind of makes sense, and this was also my idea prior to looking at the evidence. Uh, I'll give you money with strings attached. And this, this actually turns out to be a very bad idea. Every time you have any sort of condition, you fall into a trap of figuring out how you're going to measure the conditions, how you're going to um, take care of um, the people who are tracking all of this. Um, every, every time you have someone in the way, you're going to have problems. And um, the research suggested between 20 and 40 percent, depending on the country and the social situation, 20, 40 percent of the money gets displaced. So it either goes to people who should not be receiving, or it doesn't go to the people who should be receiving. And because of the intrinsic inefficiency of managing a, through a public utility such a difficult thing, um, it, it must be individual. So it doesn't go to the family, it doesn't go to the family owner or the person managing the family, it goes to the individual. And in this particular case, it was given between month zero and month three, cash in person, but the only condition was up until month three, we'll give you cash. After that, you need to have a bank account. And if you don't have a bank account, you will stop receiving the money. Because we need to be able to track it and to give it to you electronically or via your cell phone so that we don't spend the, tiny, the money and the time and also, and also having the people that hand you the money. That's another source of corruption. So universal, everybody gets it, right? Everybody. There is no strings, no conditions, and everybody gets it. Um, hugely important, minimal government intervention and regulation. So this seems to be counterintuitive because you think, well, an unconditional basic income is kind of the ultimate socialist uh, wet dream, right? Yeah, everybody, co government controls everything. Actually, it controls pretty much nothing because you can get rid of uh, almost every other social program and you just give people money, the same to everybody unconditionally, and then you let them decide what they want to do with it. So there is minimal government intervention, actually. It's the libertarian dream, not the socialist dream. Um, so let's look at the results. I've compiled this list of expectations, so what the best economists in the world said it would happen, and then what actually happened. So s some, some smart people had the idea of actually looking at reality and not just going with you know, certain ideologies, and the idea of behavioral econo economics was born. So people say, you know, it was difficult to adopt, that it wouldn't take off. 93% adoption within one month in rural villages in India. That we literally rate, you know, very, very low. Um, major problems in opening bank account. Actually, uh, very few reporting having issues in the beginning, and practically nobody had an issue after a few months. And the bank accounts were opened by, um, um, the, the banks were um, cooperatives, controlled by the people. Um, there would be no incentive to work and it would be the decrease in labor. So if you're receiving enough and essentially you can just go ahead and do nothing, why should you do anything? There would be total disincentive to work and people would stop working. And reality is there was increased labor, increased productivity and more people were working. Substantially, not just a few percentage points. Um, money would go to waste. It would be spent on prostitutes, tobacco, uh, all these public beds. And actually all social indicators were better, all of them. Anything that they could, they could calculate and track, it was better. Um, and it costs too much. So even if it is a good idea, even if it works, even if it in, you know, increases the quality of life, uh, it's going to cost too much. Actually, it costs less than, than keeping the existing social programs because they're so much obsolete. There is a lot of package uh, on it and also all the level of corruption throughout every, every step of the chain. Um, people were twice as likely to have increased their productivity at work. They had increased life livestock by 70% relative to the control group. They were more likely to increase their income from work. 
and they were three, this is the one I love, three times as likely to start a new business or production activity as others. And this is hugely important because they say, you know, um, why should you take risks? Why should you do something creative? Why should you kind of take the next step and find meaning what, you know, a lot of people uh, have talked about before. And the moment you don't have to worry about money for survival, that is the moment where you can use your social capital and your intelligence to actually start something meaningful without worrying, oh my God, how am I gonna feed my kids? How am I gonna survive next month? You, you have the freedom to start doing things that are meaningful for you as soon as the equation of how am I gonna survive is completely taken off. Uh, sorry, that variable is taken off the equation. There was a significant reduction in indebtedness. Um, in those rural villages, uh, loan sharks, they loan money for uh, as little as 50%, which is a pretty good deal, I guess, um, and as much as 90% in some cases. Uh, so a lot of people are in chronic debt, and it's basically a downward spiral which is impossible to escape from, unless you have an unconditional cash transfer every month that you can count on and you can use for your future to kind of get out of debt and make, um, they, they were, uh, there was a significant decrease in savings and spending more on transports to schools. They were more likely to make improvements to their dwellings, walls, roofs, switch better, drinking water sources, more improvement in children's weight for age. It was even more pronounced for girls because, because there was a skewing for boys. Uh, boys are better uh, in, in the societies, unfortunately they are considered better, and so they spend money first on them, but you have, you have extra cash that's just laying around, oh, I guess also the girls should uh, get what, you know, they should. Um, it was, they had more varied diets with greater relative consumption of fruits and vegetables. Um, and they were not more likely than others to spend in private beds such as alcohol or tobacco. So these are the results in the real world with real people which is exactly the opposite of what the best economists have predicted would happen. Yeah, 12,000 people. So, it, for 18 months. So, um, I'm sorry, what? $24 per month per family on average, and that was calculated to be enough for them. So, um, uh, yes, so even if we talk about the, the moral aspect or the ideological aspect, actually this topic is not as polarized as you might think because it's not a left-wing idea. Uh, if you look at those who actually proposed it in the past, you can see libertarian, you can see right-wing, you can see left-wing thinkers and politicians and economists. Um, so it, it, I think it, it kind of underlies a fundamental desire for people to find meaning and to have a sense of fairness. And every time you attach strings, you create a sense of unfairness. Because one, you increase the corruption. You, you know that there is gonna be government corruption. For example, um, the, the calculation problem for anything, anytime you centralize a calculation problem, it becomes hugely difficult. Um, in the control group, uh, the they were still receiving aid. So it's not like those villages that were left on their own. They were still receiving aid, but in terms of strings attached social programs. So for example, they were receiving wheat or, or, or rice. Okay, so what happens in reality, so in the real world, you get the bag of rice and then the women, they will start to take off rocks, 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 and then half of the bag was just rocks. And then they would distribute the rice that was left. And of course, the, the other cut was corruption. Um, and every step of the way, every time you have someone in between, there is a chance of corruption or inefficiency or just cost of managing. Even if, you're, if, you, if you don't have any corruption, even if people are very, yes? Real quick question, was this sustainable over years? Yes, 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 it costed less. The cost was less than existing social programs that did not work. So this, this study was so successful with 20 villages that, they're not, that the government now in India is going to run 1,000 villages because it was the best way that they ever found in the last 25 years of trying to fight poverty in a serious way to actually eradicate poverty. So they, 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 they're just exploding with new studies. Um, most of the study that you see on unconditional basic income have been done just in the last three years because before it was always this kind of wishy-washy um, strings attached to sort of uh, variances that produced bad results. And the first result that I gave in the beginning, which was why in the beginning I, so in my book I was against an idea of a basic income, it was because people with full unemployment benefit were the most depressed people. And that's exactly the reason, because they had strings attached. Because you don't have an incentive to 
take it to the next level because you would, lose your, you would lose your status of receiving the money every month. So it creates this psychological trap of, I do not want to start something meaningful because I'm just kind of stay here in the middle and kind of mellow. And also, it kind of creates, you know, the keeping up with the Genesis. You always wanna, you always wanna relate yourself to the one next to you. So if, if, if they see that you have food stamps when you buy groceries, if they see that you, are, that you don't have a job, but they kind of understand that you are in employment uh, and you receive benefits, that kind of social cohesion aspect is hugely important for your inner happiness. Right? That, that is uh, actually half of the subject of, of my, my first book. Like, what, what is the relationship between work and happiness? And, and one of the aspects is you need to find meaning in your community. And if you are seen as a leech, that is just, a bust, just, just about the worst thing you can do. So having an unconditional basic income where rich get it, poor get it, um, the, uh, the unemployed, everybody gets it. The children get it, um, the, um, the elderly also. There was a hugely positive outcome for the elderly and the disabled because suddenly they had something, so they were not a burden to the family, they had something that they could weigh in and actually use their capital to do something meaningful. Uh, yes? They tried in Kenya, they yes, they tried in Kenya. Uh, same exact results, but the study was not done as well uh, because of the fact they were not doing it at the community level but at the family level, but very similar results. Yes? So, so one where they were given to the yes, yes. So there was one where they were, they, they were only given to the women, and then they were given uh, unconditionally to the men, but the men didn't follow the conditions, and they were kind of going on alcohol. And so, but the study was not done well, uh, in my opinion. Yes. Please wait for the microphone. Real quickly, do you, so based on what Tony was talking about with certainty being the fundamental kind of animalistic basic need, Yeah. it seems like that money gave them certainty. That exactly. they're going to have at least food and shelter and basics, and then it gave, and then it allowed them to move on to their next need. Yeah. Is that, do you, did that resonate with you, what he was saying? Exactly. So in, in my opinion, what we are doing here is um, we are asking the big, big question that very, very uh, seldomly gets asked, which is why? I mean, why do we do anything? Anything in life as opposed to nothing. Why don't we just sit around and wait to die or just kind of pick some food? Like, why do we do anything? No, but, you know, besides the basic uh, biological functions of reproduction and kind of survival, I mean, it's because we have evolved out of necessity this sense of transcendence, of emergence, of kind of doing something new, right? So the idea that we can now finally decouple income and work or activity or your passion or your project or your, you know, what you want to do is fantastic. But it's, it's a shame that we're not doing it because we still have this feeling that if you're not being productive for society, then you're not entitled to an income. Well, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says otherwise. It says you are, it's a, it's a right to life that you have access to those things. So now that we have the technological ability and certainly the financial ability to provide for everyone, and the evidence suggests that people will not be slackers just laying around doing nothing, but that they actually should do something meaningful. And if you think about the consequences that ripple through, a lot of people will be doing voluntary work that now doesn't get counted in the GDP, just like Eric was mentioning. Um, they will be helping others. They will be creating uh, projects that might not be profitable, but actually have a social implication that is positive. So you, you kind of have all these things that are not accounted for or that you don't plan for in the beginning that kind of emerge, plus a million things that we're not even thinking about right now. Um, in addition, I should say, and this is my opinion, but um, I'm not the only one thinking this, is um, the, the, the system of profit today um, does not actually incentivize to create um, meaningful work most of the times. Um, sometimes it does, and we kind of cherry pick those examples, and we put them in the spotlight and say, isn't this great? Look at what Elon Musk is doing. I think he's doing amazingly well, but uh, for example, look at the patent system. The patent system doesn't improve innovation or kind of, no, the patent system just skews all the money and the research on things that are patentable and takes away all the money and the research on other things that are not patentable and therefore not profitable, but they could be helping humanity. But if you had a basic income, then you don't care because suddenly, imagine if you couple this with cryptocurrencies, suddenly the cost of distributing uh, that uh, money gets close to zero. So you could have an unconditional basic income based on a cryptocurrency that everybody gets on their cell phone. And 
let's say we want to go to Mars, but there is no, you know, there, there is no short-term profit. Okay, can we find 100 million people to put 10% of their income every month to finance? Yes, if we have a basic income, you just need enough people to say, oh yeah, I'll put this much. So a lot of things become possible once you decouple the two things. Yes, go ahead, Eric. have some data as opposed to yep. hypothetically talking about it. And I think that was a, a pretty well designed study. Um, one question that, that I'm o I wonder about though is, is how applicable it is to United States exactly, and other exactly developed countries. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, obviously um, you know, people are literally starving in rural yeah. India and they don't have the money to, you know, to their, their kids are starving and they don't yeah. have the money to, to invest in seed corn or fertilizer for the next year or else they'll, they'll yeah. run out of food for the next day. So it's, um, it's quite possible, in fact, I think likely that the, can, that the act, act outcomes will be different there than it might be in other countries. But it, it raises the question, and you know, following up on Tom's um, idea of, of different kinds of experiments, you know, what would it take to do something like that in the United States, not the yes. whole, not implement it, but to experiment with it. Yeah. You know, back in the envelope, I'm thinking it would be about a billion dollars to have you know ten thousand people or something like that, um, you know, getting uh, or, or maybe a hundred thousand people over. Yeah, which over is a, zero point zero 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 one percent on the profits made by right. Wall Street in one hour. Well, I think I think we could do it from the people in this room, actually, if we just uh, do that. right. No, but but but, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not actually I'm not actually doing. It. I think that there are, it would be interesting to see if we could um, find a way, maybe some combination of, of what did you say a four million dollar budget at the Department of Labor. R and D budget, so we start with that. But we, we, we <laughs> but, there, but but that would be it. Would be interesting to yeah. see how applicable it is. And, and, and yeah, I think yeah. actually, there have been some studies in, in, in Canada. Yeah, and there elsewhere. was one in Canada with about the, the forty thousand people in a in right. a city, which yeah. wasn't uh, very successful, as it, I understand. Uh, so it. so there was no discernible difference. But the thing it was not a basic income. It, it, they, they, they were given some money, which mm -hmm. was like two hundred dollars a month, which is not even close to a basic income. Yeah. So that's why so I'm that saying that, like that those studies are, are not are not proper. Yep. But I'm glad you asked that question because actually it's my next slide. Okay which is, um, well, actually, the, the after this, so, so kind of the conclusions to take out from this, uh, what makes sense logically in our heads does not necessarily translate into reality. You have to see what actually happens in the real world with real people and do randomized control trials. And um, look at the hard facts, data with studies and control for variables, but I would say it's still an early stage because proper studies done with real unconditional basic income that has all the three officials. It's unconditional, it is basic, so it's not like a small percentage of your uh, living income, but the actual income that you need, and it's, um, and, 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 and it's universal. Um, so we need more studies, and we need better studies, actually. Um, and in particular, we have an opportunity because Switzerland, it's much closer to the United States as a living condition than it is India, and they're going to vote probably next year for an income for all. And the proposal is right now $4,000 a month equivalent to every citizen. Uh, $4,000 equivalent US dollars a month. But the price of things in Zurich is about 70% uh, higher than the price of things in New York. So you kind of have to put that into perspective. My understanding in Switzerland is the public sentiment is to vote against. So, right? so that's why they have between one and two years of public discussion before. So the, the system in Switzerland has essentially allows for the people to ask for a public referendum. So they can, it's called a pro propositive or a, you know, uh, kind of proactive um, uh, legislation from the bottom up. So um, they've actually had some interesting proposals for the, in the past. For example, there was a minimum wage, uh, but it was voted against. And interestingly enough, it's not, it was not because people were against the minimum wage increase, but because of the specific and the technicality of how much it was increased. So it, it, the devil is in the details, just like with in unconditional versus conditional strings attached. I think you have to get it right. Yes? Yeah, to, there already is a natural experiment for this in the United States, and it's the Alaskan uh, dividend from the oil proceeds. Yeah, except it's not an income. It, again, it's like the Canada uh, thing. It's, uh, it's a small percentage. Well, every Alaskan gets $5,000 a year from, from the oil right, dividend. Right, $5,000 a year is not even close to what you no. actually need to survive. Well, no, no, but I'm just saying, you know, it hasn't caused widespread social dislocation, and it's wildly popular Sure, in sure. Yeah. And so when Charles, Charles Murray talks about this, and as the president of the 
NAACP of pretty much the opposite end of the ideological spectrum, Charles um, He was talking about making about $10,000 per year. And his point was that it actually gave incentive to people um, to combine kind of, so you might have like five people living in Detroit, for instance, or five people living in rural Kansas, places where $10,000 can actually stretch really far. But actually, if they're living in, in a collective way, then it can stretch much further. And that it would also sort of reverse some of the patterns of the poor kind of crowding into cities looking for social services, mm -hmm. because it would actually be cheaper and easier to sur survive in most states in uh, rural places. So it's, but, but it's, it's been talked about, and that I think is probably at the low end. The idea wasn't to, to make it sort of easy or comfortable to survive, to keep people hungry, if you will, but to also make it possible for them to survive if they focus their efforts. Right, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. There is a lot, yeah. I, I just had the quick question, it's so, it's so fascinating. I was, I was just intrigued, did, did they do a quantitative analysis of like inflow and outflow comparatively between the control groups? You were talking about new business starts being higher and like did they actually quantitatively look at that? I guess over 18 months. Yeah, they months. did, they did. So okay. some of it, that, that's why I said that this particular study was well conducted because usually studies are self-evaluation and so you kind of just fill out a form and you say, of course you're gonna say, I drank less and I started business, oh, my house looks pretty cool. They, they were actually in on the field in situ and they were checking things. So they were actually uh, having real data coming from both the personal um, information that was coming from individuals and the things they were observing. So yes. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, on a last note, um, I don't think you know, we should be believers of anything. For example, I was not a believer. I looked at the data and the evidence and then trying to make sense of it, I'm, try I'm now understanding the social implications and the kind of uh, psychosocial aspects of it. And um, so always look at the evidence. And lastly, this is not a panacea, okay? So I don't think that um, it works everywhere, it works the same. And the, clearly, cultural differences work, uh, matter. So um, depending on the place, depending also the kind of our moral compass in that specific region, how much we are evolved socially, things change. So it's not a panacea, it, it's just a piece in the puzzle, I think, in, in my opinion. There are other factors, and I, I wrote this paper last month for uh, a, um, uh, a scientific American competition, social evolution through massively decentralized distributed resilient networks. So it's kind of the uh, convergence of five major pillars uh, of distributed networks uh, going from uh, Bitcoin and kind of the whole um, solar. And uh, so I, I, I think all of these things will play a major role in the future. And a universal basic income or some sort of variation of that can be one of those major pillars that we should uh, ponder and consider very seriously. Okay. Thank you very much.